everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to be doing my summer reading wrap up at long last. If you like these sorts of videos, you may have noticed I haven't posted a reading wrap up in a while, and that's because I've been in a slump ish. Uh, finding pretty consistently this year, as I've mentioned in a couple of reading wrap ups, that as I am drafting and revising my next YA thriller, I'm finding it really challenging to read fiction in particular, read consistently. So, it's mostly non-fiction, some really good non-fiction though that I have been reading, but two thrillers too. One I absolutely loved and the other I kind of didn't like. I have some slightly spicy spoilery thoughts on The Maidens to give you a sneak peek if you're like, ooh. So watch everything that comes before that if you're interested or skip right to it. Gonna do timestamps as always and it was my first audiobook, and I have some thoughts and feelings. But first, I read Empire of Pain by Patrick Radden Keefe. This is about the Sackler Empire. They of Purdue, Pharma, and OxyContin. Might sound familiar to you if you are a John Oliver fan. Actually, how I got the tip on this book, he did an interview with Seth Meyers, and he was like, I'm really looking forward to this book coming out. So. I picked it up and it was so funny watching his most recent report on the opioid epidemic and the Sacklers realizing the source for the entire report is this book. I felt like I was in a special club. It is a, it was a really good read. I, I enjoyed it on the same level and in a very similar way as Bad Blood, which I read last year. That was by John Carreyou. That was about Theranos. This is very similar in that it's about in some ways, not a cult of personality, but the personality of a very specific family of super rich individuals who practice in corporate sociopathy. It's the trend of companies that are so ruthless about profit at any cost that they cause massive harm to lots of people. No coincidence that those are both stories of medical companies and just the fascination of the just lack of human empathy and feeling because money, money, money. And it's something I just find really fascinating in terms of like tracing the origins of a company like this, uh, going through kind of the hows and the heights of how bonkers it got and then of course looking at the ap aftermath and trying to take this to task. This really is about the Sacklers so it's told in three parts. It's the three generations of Sacklers-ish. Really it's two substantially starting with the three original brothers who came out of the depression. Uh, specifically Arthur Sackler who started it all. Though What becomes so interesting is Arthur wasn't involved in Purdue Pharma though he bought it for his brothers and it's his brothers offspring who did all the oxy stuff but Arthur himself like reading it his origins and his kind of he was a crafty businessman you realizing that he is the father of modern pharmaceutical advertising that he simultaneously like owned an advertising firm that did these campaigns placing ads in a magazine that he owned a medical journal that he owned promoting drugs that he also owned. Uh, Arthur Sackler was the mind behind Valium, another uh, wonder drug, blockbuster drug. Um, I mean, you can definitely see it as a blueprint for what we later saw with Oxy. Go figure, it's all traced back to one family. And then part two is the rise of Purdue Pharma and everything with Oxy. And then part three is kind of like the modern day Sacklers and how they're all about putting all their names on museums and minimizing their connections to all of this horrible stuff. And there's a lot of the legal and judicial stuff. It's all really, really interesting. So if you are interested in this facet of the opioid epidemic, super rich American families, corporate sociopathy, I highly recommend it. It was a really juicy read. I wanted to go back to the book every day. I feel like I got a lot out of it. Highly recommend. So next I read The Radium Girls by Kate Moore. Um, I had an Amazon coupon. I saw it uh, at a good price on ebook and I've seen the movie. So I was like, I'll read it. I was not prepared for how gro good this book is and how Kate Moore is now like an auto buy nonfiction author for me. 
Kate Moore redefines or defines narrative nonfiction. It this it is like reading a story. You are in the perspective, you are in the shoes of characters who are real people in history as they move through the story. It's full of tension and like characters to root for, but they're real people. And that's what's fascinating. I was hooked. I was turning pages. I was having to resist googling to like see the real history. Though of course I watched the movie so I was aware of it but the movie like took a lot of the real people and like merged them together and made them composites which is nice so it, it actually meant I didn't know exactly what was going to happen to the different people. Um, it's it's upsetting to read at many points. It's harrowing like uh, these it I should say what it is that the radium girls were the women who worked for companies in the 1910s, 20s, and into the 30s, long after the companies knew that radium was dangerous, which is part of the story. Um, painting dials, uh, painting watch faces and whatnot, uh, at first for the war effort, but then for like trends, because like people love these, ooh, glow in the dark radium things. And the women who slowly were poisoned by the substance because part of what they were taught at the factories was to lick the brush, dip it in, and then paint, and then lick, oh gosh, it's awful. So there are descriptions of like jaw necrosis and really terrible things happening to people, just all the different cancers that the women got and horrible ailments, and their fight for justice. It is a really engaging, harrowing read. Um, if you, I'd say honestly, if you like historical fiction of this era, especially read this, it truly reads like fiction. And I, I loved it so much that when Amazon Kindle recommended another Kate Moore book to me, and I didn't even realize it literally had come out like two days earlier, I bought it full price, brand new. And that was the woman that they could not silence. One woman, her incredible fight for freedom and the men who tried to make her disappear. Very similar to Radium Girls, Kate Moore is drawn to women in history, historical women who are uh, less known, less written about. And in, across these two books, there's the theme of kind of the fight for justice and changing the legal system in some way. And this is exactly the same. I had never heard of Elizabeth Packard. Uh, she was a, a woman, an American woman living in, I, I think it was Indiana, maybe Illinois, but I think it was Indiana in 1860 uh, with her husband. And she had, I think four or five kids. And one day, uh, her husband had her carted off to a mental uh, asylum and had her declared insane and thus bega began Elizabeth's nightmare through uh, she just she she didn't realize as her husband's wife she was considered property I mean maybe she kind of knew that but two um, what he said went uh, all he had to do was bribe uh, some members of bribe I mean manipulate some members of his congregation because he was a preacher and two doctors and she was permanently and legally declared insane and and had all of her rights taken away and so she was sent to this mental institution um, but Elizabeth was a whip smart woman and you want to know why she was committed and this is part of the story that she talked too much, had her own opinions, specifically disagreed with her husband, and that made her insane. And it wasn't just Elizabeth. This happened to many, many women in the period. And she shows up at this asylum and meets other women whose husbands basically wanted to get rid of their wives. And so they're like, oh, she's 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 mentally infirm because she, she has opinions. And in Elizabeth's specific case, her husband was a preacher. Elizabeth found that she t disagreed with his uh, re religion, with his uh, form of Christianity uh, in, in part because his church was pro-slavery and she was an abolitionist and so she, when she switched churches he was like my wife is insane and needs to be committed so it is as I said it reads like fiction you are in Elizabeth's shoes every step of the way and she goes to this hospital and she's trusting the guy in charge she's like he's gonna help me get out and she's writing letters and I'm like Elizabeth you're in danger and it snowballs from there of course because Moore chose her as a subject like you know reading you're like okay she must have gotten out she this must have gone to court and I won't tell you all the ups and downs because that's part of the fun of reading it and there were lots of ups and downs but indeed uh, this is a woman who had to work for years tirelessly to have her story told to make legal changes and she 
I, it, it blows my mind that she is a is, she's an American woman historical figure that no one really knows about. And her story is incredible. It was an incredible read. Again, I highly recommend it. I really want it to be made into a movie. It has just all of these complex characters and really interesting antagonists who are real people. There's even like some like romantic tension, but like with a twist, there's characters to root for. If, again, if you like nonfiction, pick this up. If you like American history, like especially obscure American history, especially feminist history or obscure feminist history, obscure American feminist history, pick this up. It was engrossing, but even if you like historical fiction, it reads like fiction, but Kate Moore is an incredibly talented writer. As I said, uh, Kate Moore is now an auto buy for me because she's drawn to stories of uh, undertold stories, lesser known stories of women in history who did incredible things uh, in the face of injustice. And yeah, this is just an incredible read. So next I read a celebrity memoir. I read Forever Young by Hayley Mills. Hayley Mills is an actress I grew up with in the sense that I was growing up in the 80s and 90s and her movies, uh, they were on the Disney Channel. I didn't have the Disney Channel because I didn't have cable, but I watched it at my cousin's house and ABC would have like the wonderful world of Disney. And so I devoured all of her movies like so many kids. Uh, this was the original Parent Trap Kids, pre Lindsay Lohan reboot uh, and also like like Pollyanna, like the Moon Spinners, the Castaways, like she did all these movies, that darn cat. And I just, I, I definitely had like a kid girl crush on Hayley Mills. She was just so like refined and British, but like kind of like goofy in this really relatable way. And she also did The Parent Trap 2 which I loved and Good Morning Miss Bliss which was the precursor to Saved by the Bell. And I give you all of this for context of why I read it, but also why I found it slightly disappointing. And just that I guess I was expecting like a memoir of her whole life, but this is a very specific snapshot. And to that end, like if what you were interested in is Hayley Mills as a child star and kind of coming out of being a child star and like looking at the Disney era basically and how that all came about and what it was like, this is that book. It's it's a play by play. It moves chronologically through like, this is how I was discovered. This is what it was like making Pollyanna. Then this is what it was like making the parent trap and so on. But the book ends at the point where she has her first child. Um, and, and thematically, it makes sense. Like I see what she was doing, but I was still surprised and slightly disappointed when I reached the end. She gets married to a much older man, by the way, which is I didn't realize that about Hayley Mills, but it makes a lot of sense when I'm like, why did her career kind of peter out and she disappeared? There are reasons and she even kind of admits to them some of kind of the pitfalls of how her career was managed and whatnot. And it's really interesting, especially also because I didn't realize this, but I'm sure the Brits out there are like, well, duh, Hayley Mills had famous parents. <laughs> And I just never really realized that her dad, John Mills, was a super famous British actor, like a classically trained British actor. He did theater and he did like lots of famous classic movies. Her mother was a playwright who wrote Whistle Down the Wind, which was turned into a movie with Hayley Mills, which I haven't seen, but my context is the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical adaptation of it. But I'm like, oh, she had already famous, like established wealthy British parents. It all kind of makes sense, but it's kind of, it, it makes it more fun because she was surrounded by really famous people as a child. She talks about like her godmother, Vivian Lee, who gave her a puppy. She, she talks about Larry, who was Sir Lawrence Olivier and his wife, Joan, Joan Plowright. She talks about Uncle Dickie, who is Richard Attenborough, because <laughs> her dad was friends with all of these people. And so it is kind of fun like to, to get her perspective of what it was like to just hang out with these super, like these legends of British stage and film as a kid. She also very briefly, as in one date, dated a beetle. She went out with George Harrison once and she tells that story. So that kind of stuff is fun. Plus, of course, the Disney stuff. She was given access to the Disney archives and for the first time in her life, she actually saw like communication, like letters between her parents and Walt Disney and got more perspective on her career and like some of the ways in which it unfolded. And she's relatively candid in terms of reflections on her 
being a child star, the pros and the cons. And she, I'd, I'd say the main thing, and I, I took a peek at what other people thought of this as well, and I'd say I agree. She's candid enough, but it never really gets deep. I'd say it kind of does about a big thing, which was her mother's alcoholism. Like she's pretty honest about that. And she even is relatively honest at one point about how maybe her dad was a little bit jealous of some of her career highs. But for the most part, like she's candid-ish, but it feels very surface in a lot of places. Especially like I realized in hindsight once I finished, she mentions having an eating disorder once, and there's definitely a thread of poor Haley Mills. It just made me feel so bad for her. Like even still now as an adult, she reflects on how fat she got as a teenager. And then like I went and looked up pictures and I was like, Haley Mills was never fat. Haley Mills was never fat. And it just makes me feel bad that she felt that way about herself. And it's just sad and I'm not sure she ever fully processed it, but like, I remembered, oh, she did mention having an eating disorder. So there's it, like one mention of that in the book, FYI, but then it disappears. But surely that was something that informed multiple of her movie making experiences and whatnot. And it's not that I want a blow by bow play by play of having a persistent eating disorder. I really don't. But that's what made me click and go, oh, she's candid on it in a surface way, but because she's covering a lot of ground and it's mostly play-by-plays of what it was like to film movies. It's just kind of, it sits in the middle as far as a memoir is concerned. It's a nice snapshot into a certain era of Hollywood filmmaking, specifically Disney childhood classics, and I generally enjoyed it, but it cuts off in like the mid 70s, so like you're skipping the last 40 years of her life, which is kind of like, head scratcher. Hey, if there's a part two, I'll probably read it. Uh, but I think some people may be disappointed if they want something that is a little more in depth and candid in a in a deeper way and like generally she's also just clearly a nice person which is nice actually to know that she's genuinely a nice pretty down-to-earth person um so thus she's nice about everyone uh with one exception there's one actor she calls a misogynist but otherwise she only has nice things to say about pretty much everyone in the book so that kind of has its limitations but it is what it is i mean she's a nice person so what are you gonna do but yeah it was it was perfectly fine. Uh, so if you also like Hayley Mills and this sounds like it would be interesting to you, pick it up. But yeah, it's not like the most scintillating celebrity memoir. Next, I read A Familiar Sight by Brianna Labuskis, and this was a pleasant surprise. So Amazon does a first reads thing, it's a prime thing, where you get a free book every month that is Amazon published, and this one, it jumped out at me in the description. I mean, you'll know why as soon as I tell you. The main character is a sociopath, and I was like, I'm intrigued. Um, and what, where it surprised me was I started reading it and like two days later I was done. Like it, it temporarily semi broke my reading slump with fiction at least. Um, I really loved it. So the, the basic premise is Dr. Gretchen White is diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. It's sad that I'm forgetting what her job is, but the doctor part, I, th I think it's actually like she has a PhD in psychology or something, but that's, it, it doesn't matter. She is a police consultant. So she works with the Boston PD on cases where the head detective guy, like the guy she has a relationship with, Jaunacy, um, suspects that maybe he's dealing with a case where there are one or more suspects who may have antisocial personality disorder, and he brings Gretchen in to get her perspective on the case. They have a really interesting history where the reason he knows her is that she was the prime suspect in her aunt's murder when she was a child. <laughs> it's really interesting and it's like this thing that sits between them. There was never any proof that she did anything and her aunt's murder remains unsolved. All they know is that they found Gretchen standing over the body but as Gretchen kind of she, it, it's a little wink-ish in that Gretchen never fully discusses it to leave the reader a little bit of doubt as well. Also because this is a series and the next one is going to solve the aunt's murder and I am super here for it. But she says that she was fascinated by the blood and the body parts and that's why they found her over the body. It's really interesting. So the actual case in the book, see that's all like backstory, but 
it's really interesting. And I don't normally go for detective fiction, as you know, like murder mystery detective solves case, but there's something about like, it's the angle. Her as a police consultant, because this is a very specific skill set she's bringing, but it also makes her an unreliable narrator that she kind of admits to. Like there are some really fun scenes where, cause she's paired with a younger detective and they're investigating the case and I'm about to tell you what the plot is, um, where she'll, cause she's always uh, reading, trying to read people and judge what they're feeling as a neurotypical person and also how she should be reacting. And she even wonders to herself if she's interpreting that you know, kind of wash of emotion correctly, if she's interpreting an interaction between two people correctly. And for the reader, it's really fun because you're like, yeah, so is she? How should I judge this character? Who, oh, I, I love the way it kept me on my toes and it kept me guessing. And it did keep me on my toes and it kept me guessing. The main plot is that Gretchen's friend, who is a high priced fancy lawyer, she leaves her this really ominous voicemail that just says, I made a mistake she's just like you. And the case she was working on involved a child who may or may not have murdered her mother and everyone thinks is a psychopath. So that piques Gretchen's interest immediately. Um, her friend turns up dead after leaving her this voicemail and Gretchen is like, this girl, she must mean the girl, she's just like me, so that must mean that she thinks she was being framed. I'm going to look into this case, but also, someone killed my friend, the lawyer. So that's kind of how she gets drawn in. And so you get Gretchen's forward linear perspective of looking into this case of this girl who allegedly murdered her mother. And you get the POV of the husband slash dad, uh, mostly back in time. You get some things now, but you get his perspective. Sometimes it jumps around. Uh, sometimes it's two weeks before the murder. Sometimes it's two months before the murder. Sometimes it's five years before the murder. And you're getting like the, all of the, f the texture of his, how he met his wife, this uh, thing in his past where did he kill his ex-girlfriend is a thing that comes up. You get kind of the perspective of he and his wife realizing that something was off about their daughter, stuff with their daughter. They have two other children that the uh, ale allegedly potentially psychopathic daughter uh, terrorizes. And so there's the building tension of like jumping back and forth in time, getting the backstory, working your way up to the murder of trying to piece together as Gretchen is piecing together who everyone is, who is lying, if this girl was framed. It's real. I, I really liked it. <laughs> as I said, I just, I loved the both reliable and unreliable narrator. Like Gretchen really does bring an interesting perspective to the case, but also sometimes can't even trust her own judgment when it comes to other people. And yeah, I flew through it. I gave it five stars. I'm 100% going to pick up the next book. I, and I don't normally read series, let alone like detective-y fiction-y series, but I loved the detective she was paired with, Marconi. I loved the Boston setting. As I said, I love the context. I want to know what happened to Gretchen's aunt. And frankly, if the author wrote more books with this character, I would read them. I really liked it. I loved how nuanced Gretchen was. Um, Cause you know, as much as I love the sociopath trope and I do love a good sociopath trope, I find it equally as interesting when you have, cause most people with antisocial personality disorder are not killers. They're just not. So I loved that aspect of the Gretchen, Dr. Gretchen Waite character being that kind of person with antisocial personality disorder, who's super self-aware, who kind of sees the world through this very specific lens, I really enjoyed it. Which brings me to the next book I read, also fiction, also a thriller, my first audiobook ever. And you're like, how? And I'm like, I know. It's just, I, I read before bed and when we were able to leave the house, I would read on the train. So I was always reading on my devices, on like Kindle or physical books. I still love physical books. And I had just never had cause to listen to an audiobook, but, but Beautifully Bookish Bethany recommended uh, I read The Maiden. She was like, I want to hear your thoughts on The Maidens. Uh, the audiobook is really good. It's on NetGalley. And so I was like, what a great way to try audiobooks because I'll get it on NetGalley. It's like risk-free trial for me. And I was approved and I was approved for that and not the ebook version. So 
I listened to the audiobook version. So as I teased at the top, I had mixed feelings about The Maidens by Alex Mikolides. You may be familiar with the author. He broke out big a couple of years ago on his adult thriller debut, The Silent Patient, which I have not read, which now I am slightly interested to read. Like, I'm... I'm curious if I'll feel as polarized by the ending as I did on The Maidens. And yeah, so I have I have feelings re my first audiobook and I have feelings re the book itself. And I'll say at first when I finished, I definitely had a feeling of am I feeling away because of the format? Did I miss things because of the format? And so I actually went back to the beginning and I re-listened to parts of this audiobook just to sanity check myself. If I had the physical copy, I would have gone back to look for the stuff I was looking for. Because like, in a nutshell, spoiler free, I, I simultaneously felt that the twist was so clearly telegraphed. And I can't say why, because the reason it was so clearly telegraphed is spoilers. But simultaneously was so poorly t foreshadowed that it frustrated me. Like I got to it and I was like, of course that's the solution. But it wasn't properly foreshadowed. It was like that. And it, it confused me at first. Then I went back and listened to confirm that I wasn't imagining things, then it annoyed me. Then I read other reviews, uh, both mixed and negative reviews of it on Goodreads, and then I felt a little more like grounded, like, okay, it wasn't just me. And it was also really interesting going through reviews on Goodreads and they, a lot of people are knocking it for some ham-fisted writing. And this is one where I'll say, the audiobook performance was fantastic. Uh, the main audiobook reader was Louise Brealey, who was an actress on Sherlock, and I thought her narration was fantastic. But reading some of the lines in a couple of the reviews, like, like dialogue exchanges, I was like, oh, if I'd read that on the page, I probably would have side-eyed that a lot more. Louise Brealey did a fantastic job in her performance, because, so what is The Maidens about? First off, it is definitely dark academia. So if you like a good dark academia vibe, I, I will say it certainly delivers on that. It's like tick boxes of dark academia. It's about a woman named Mariana. She is a group therapist. She's currently like grieving her husband drowned a year ago and she's still really dealing with that. And so she's clinging to the only family she has left who is Zoe, her niece. Zoe's parents also befell tragedy. They died in a car crash. Tragedy is a theme here because classical Greek li literature and Mariana and Zoe are Greek, <laughs> dark academia. Um, Zoe is a student at Cambridge and her close friend is brutally murdered and Mariana goes up to Cambridge to support her. Mariana also attended Cambridge, which is where she met her deceased husband, Sebastian. So going to Cambridge brings up all sorts of memories for her. It triggers a lot of her grief. And I'll say my favorite thing about the book, I think, was the depiction of grief. There were some really gorgeous passages. This book is definitely uh, markety in that sense, where just like some of the writing and the characterization and the theming was very like lush. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely appreciated the depiction of grief. And Zoe tells her aunt that her friend was having a romantic relationship with an American professor teaching at the school named Professor Fosca. I do have to say, Louise Brealey's pronunciation was so British that I thought his name was Fosker. It's Fosca, which is just an Americanism, an Italian Americanism there, but it like threw me for a bit. But um, that he was having a sexual relationship with her and that he must have killed her because she threatened to like tell the administration. And Mariana, they go to this girl's memorial service and like she sees the creepiest thing, this professor who um, she, senses, this is the, where the therapist aspect comes in, is probably a high functioning psychopath and like, or sociopath. And like she, she diagnoses him in the text and he's a, he's a, so he's like got that like creepy character vibe. He has this flock of young, beautiful young women at Cambridge who follow him around who are called the maidens and the girl who died was part of this little social clique like they they show up in white flowing gowns to the memorial service and they they talk like really pretentious literary like majors 
And so of course as Mariana is investigating the murder, and logically speaking the book really stretches how a group therapist who technically, yes, is an alumni, but somehow manages to insert herself into this murder investigation and on campus without really any consequences. I mean, she gets a slap on the wrist at one point from the cops, but the fact that she was al literally allowed onto the scene of the murders because like, oh, she recognizes this consultant. It stretches a little, but you have to go with it. You have to go with it, right? And there's also this really weird thing where she meets this guy on the train and he like decides he's in love with her and becomes obsessed with her and is kind of stalking her. There's some, there's some weird elements, but so of course you know what happens. Some of the other maidens start also being serial killed and it's like, ooh, she fixates on the American professor and it's like it has to be him and kind of spirals down from there. And I'll say like it managed the obsessive spiral very well. As I said, some good dark academia vibes, sneaking around Cambridge, etc. But okay, so we're I started to not be sure if the problem was the audiobook, but having read other reviews, I don't think it was just the audiobook. I would reach points toward the end of Act 2 and going into Act 3 where characters would show up, and I was like, wait, am I supposed to know who you are? Were you I think maybe they, you were mentioned my name in the beginning, but I don't know who you are. And I thought maybe I'd missed it with the audiobook because like there were definitely moments where like m my eyes shut as I was listening in bed and I missed some things and had to go back. But no, I saw in other reviews that there were like some characters are just like not very well established and like d don't have a good function in the story and it made me feel better. So, th so that's the, th the thing. So. I'll say briefly spoiler free before I jump into the brief spoiler section where I discuss why this book kind of didn't work for me. The main thing is, as I said, the solution felt very clearly telegraphed thematically. Thus, none of the red herrings really worked for me in the sense that I never truly felt in that, you know, gut tension way that any of these kind of cliffhangery, ooh, creepy person moments could be the solution. So I never really in invested completely in the imminent danger that the character was facing. And that's kind of a bummer. So to that end, it has the Dark Academia vibes, but I never felt the real menace in a real way. There's also this one thing that bugged me at the time and it wasn't until I saw other reviews mention it too that I was like, oh, it's not just me. Like I had dismissed it. There's this whole sequence where Mariana, so remember, she has self-diagnosed as a group therapist that this guy, this professor, is probably a sociopath, right? And probably a serial killer. She's really sure that he is killing these girls and she's determined to get proof, yes. He invites her to dinner because there's this creepy sexual tension that eh, wasn't really into. She has creepy sexual tension with multiple people in this book, actually. Um, and she agrees to go to dinner with him by herself in his private chambers. And at the time I was like, why would she do that? This, this, that is really, really stupid. Who would do that? And then I, I read some reviews. Look. I don't normally jump right to male author. I swear I don't. But another review I saw pointed out like, this is where it's kind of clear that a guy wrote this because any woman would immediately be like, I can't be alone in a vulnerable position with someone who I think is a serial killer or who at best is very sexual predator creepy. Um, at the least she wouldn't go alone or she would pick a public place or she would break into his place when he wasn't there or she would have like a friend on text like you would set up like a fail safe to like and none of that happens because the author just didn't think of it. And my main thought in that scene was get out, get out. Why are you here? This is so stupid. So that's just something. So spoilers. So if you're here, you've either read the book and you're also like feeling salty and you want to talk about it or you haven't and you don't care and you just want me to tell you. So Zoe the niece is the killer. It's, this is what, so the whole thing where thematically I knew that it had to be 
at a certain point I knew it had to be Zoe, but I like had a brief moment of, is it Sebastian? I was like, did he fake his death? Because basically the book is super heavy handed about the whole Mariana is Greek and tragedy follows her and Fosca is a classics professor and there are postcards quoting Greek classic tragedies left at the murder scenes or like the victims receive these postcards before they die. It is really heavy handed. There's also the repeated theme. There's literally a group therapy session, which makes no sense by the way, with the maidens where she gets them all to sit down with her, where they're discussing, instead of, instead of discussing the murder, they start discussing Greek tragedy, because that makes sense. And I'm not smart enough to remember which one it is, but because I haven't, I honestly haven't read all of those. I'm not that smart. Uh, but don't worry, the book will tell you. The book is very smart. The book thinks it's very smart. And it, they literally have a discussion about a character who has to sacrifice herself for her father. And they literally say like, but she has to because that's what makes it a tragedy or something like that. So the theming is just very heavy handed with Greek tragedy, tragedy, sacrifice, family. So I knew from at least the halfway point that the solution had to be family. It had to be tragedy. So I was like either Sebastian faked his death or it's Zoe. And it was just clear. So then I actually got to the twist and of course it's Zoe, but then the book, this is where the twist isn't foreshadowed at all, not in any reasonable way that is fair to the reader. The book cheats essentially and you know how I feel about that. You find out that, okay, Zoe was in love with Sebastian because he groomed her for years as a sociopathic pedophile, something like that. Like it's heavily implied with what Zoe says that he was a sociopath. Also, because I forgot, there's a second point of view in the book uh, where as you're getting Mariana, you're also hearing a letter by a guy who like grew up on a farm with a mom and a dad and his dad killed his dog and then his mom left and he doesn't feel anything. And it's like clear that this, this character in the letter is definitely a sociopath. And then you find out it's Sebastian's letter to Zoe and it ends with you're the only person I can ever have be a human with like that kind of cliche so you find out that as so Zoe's parents had died and Mariana and Sebastian were like parents to her she was like their adoptive daughter she lived with them when she wasn't at boarding school or at Cambridge and you find out that he groomed her started having sex with her when she was 15 years old that Sebastian murdered Mariana's dad because he found out and Zoe has been like obsessively like psychotically in love with Mariana's husband and that this whole thing, the whole serial killing people at Cambridge and framing the American professor thing was a plot she and Sebastian devised to murder Mariana. But before it could happen, Mariana insisted that Sebastian go on vacation with her and he accidentally drowned. So Zoe is doing this as revenge to kill Mariana anyway, even though the whole point of the plot in the first place was so that she could run off with Mariana's husband. And on the theme of drowning, people are using the pool outside. So if you hear splashing, that's it. But I was just like, I actually really love this twist on a surface level. Like from a story level, it's hitting some really like kind of some story tropes that I enjoy. It's dark, it's twisted. I'm like, huh, it's basically secret sociopath, except it's incredibly poorly done. So first off you realize, wow, Marianne is literally the world's worst therapist because we're meant to believe that over a 20 year relationship, 20 year relationship, she met him at Cambridge when she was like 18 years old and he died when she was like 37. So approximately 20 years, there was not one sign. And now look, there's rose colored glasses and loving your partner, but a woman who had to get an advanced degree in psychology and counseling didn't spot a single sign. And let's say, let's say she didn't spot a single sign. The book doesn't give us a single hint that he could be like this. And here's the thing, sociopaths can't hide that long, not with the people they are closest to. There's at least going to be flashes of anger, uh, an argument here or there, certain aspects to their personality. Maybe it's like a control factor. Maybe it's a callous comment here or there about someone's loss. It has to be something and a smart, good author would have planted 
hints in the book that astute readers it could at least catch on the first read or go back and find later. And I went back and I listened again to the entire, to the introduction of Sebastian, the description of the relationship, the chapter where he died, the introduction of Zoe, like the backstory with Zoe, listening again to hear if either there were clues that Sebastian had a secretly dark personality or that Zoe exhibited a shift because essentially she was groomed, abused, and raped. She is a victim, um, but also a serial killer. Fun times, but I didn't see it. There's just a brief mention that Zoe went through a depressive period as a young teen after her parents died, but then she, she came out of it and isn't that great. That could be offered as a clue that she came out of it, of course, because she was in love with Sebastian and all that jazz, except the book doesn't give the reader the opportunity to even question anything, because it's like two lines of, of narr narration in an early chapter. Because we find out specifically that the first time she and Sebastian made love, gag, she was 15 and, and it was in the olive grove at the granddad's estate and that's like how he found out and Sebastian killed him. You couldn't have had a line about, you know, that, that summer Zoe turned 15, it was like she turned a corner, you know, I was sure she'd fallen in love with a Greek boy but she wouldn't tell, like something? But also, part part two, part one, Mariana's a terrible therapist, it turns out. Part two, Mariana's a terrible parent. She sees Zoe as a surrogate daughter. Zoe lives with her when she's not at boarding school or Cambridge. So like, over years and years and years. She's a terrible parent, or aunt at best, who doesn't notice anything, any signs, and especially as a therapist, she, she doesn't observe any behavior in her niece, doesn't really think about any changes, doesn't seem to ever inquire as to her personal life. Again, it would have made Mariana seem like very nosy and heteronormative, but you know what would have been a great potential clue thread for any reader to grasp or go back and look at? Is it if it had been a running theme that Zoe had never had a boyfriend and this was something that really concerned her aunt. We would have been like, man, aunt, calm the F down. Some people may have even speculated, well, maybe Zoe has a secret girlfriend and she's afraid to tell you and then surprise, she's in a creepy, rapey relationship with your husband, but no, none of that exists. Basically, it's not foreshadowed at all. The only reason it's obvious that it's Zoe is because of the classical Greek tragedy theming of this quasi-literary novel. That's it. But as I said, I actually liked the twist on a surface level. Once I read it, I was like, ooh, if only I had read the book that properly supported this twist, this would be a home run, because I like the idea of the twist. Gosh, wouldn't this book be interesting from Zoe's perspective? And actually, until I got to the twist, I kept thinking that Mariana was the wrong narrative for this narrator for this book, because of the whole dark academia thing, where it kind of like just never quite settled for me with the the whole the book does narrative logical like backflips to get Mariana to insert herself into the story in a way that propels the mystery forward and I kept thinking like this should be told from the point of view of a student Zoe makes the most sense because she's the one who was friends with the victim blah 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 but of course you couldn't do that without blowing the book's twist but food for thought maybe even multi POV would have been interesting Anyway, um, we're gonna end the spoilers there. So at the end of the day, because of those reasons I just discussed that people just watched, um, it just didn't land for me. When I first literally ended it and I was just shell-shocked and I had to go back and to the beginning and, and listen to see if I missed anything, I was like, I guess it's kind of a four star. But ultimately I settled on a three because I still enjoyed the reading experience generally. The audiobook was fantastic. Like the production value was really good. It still had some great vibes. And I, I mean, other than the twist and climax not being really supported by the rest of the book, in my opinion, I still enjoyed it. So if you like the vibes, honestly, the things that bother me might not bother you as much and you might enjoy it. So like it, those things bothered me, but they didn't bother Bethany and so it's kind of fun to compare and contrast. But yeah, ultimately I can't help feeling that this is one that like maybe needed one more dev edit pass and especially like as a writer I'm like, oh if only the author had had that time, but oh well. So last but not least I finished off with Brooke Shields. There was a little girl, the real story of my mother and me. So another like celebrity memoir. Um, 
because I watched a YouTube video about Pretty Baby and I was like, I wonder if Brooke Shields wrote a memoir. And go figure, she literally wrote a memoir about that exact thing. Meaning, this memoir is all about the relationship with her mother. And her mother was quite notorious. If you're not familiar with Brooke Shields, Brooke Shields started out as a child star, but specifically she was in two very kind of sexually explicit for the time movies when she was very, very young. Though it was good reading the book realizing her mother did insist she used body doubles, at least according to Brooke, so you could feel a little better about child nudity in the movies. Well, you still have a 12 year old kissing a grown ass man. Her first kiss was with a man 25 years older than her because she played a child prostitute in this movie. It's a whole thing. But that's the lens that her mom is a single mom and Brooke is an only child and they have this incredibly intense codependent relationship where her mom was her manager and made all of these things happen for her. They depended on each other. She she supported her mom, but her mom supported her. Except her mom was also a raging alcoholic. And I'm sure uh, contemporaries, like Brooke Shields contemporaries, will have contacts that I don't have um, because like, I know who Brooke Shields is because I watched The Blue Lagoon as a kid. I liked that movie. But, like, by the time I was growing up, Brooke Shields was on Suddenly Susan, so I've always had that context for her. But I'm sure her contemporaries, apparently there were lots of tabloid stories about, like, her mom's antics and, like, what a controlling drunk she was and how, like, people didn't like her on set. And so you're getting Brooke's perspective of what her career was like. And that was definitely really interesting. She's pretty honest. Um, she's she's pretty candid like she's like my mom was an alcoholic uh, at the time I really rationalized the abuse but now that I'm a mother myself like I see it she does make some excuses of like we were more free in the 70s like the sexual stuff I did like posing topless and it was just normal but I would never let my daughters do it now and that's partly true and partly are like Still, the choices that your mom made for you are definitely interesting. And, and in fact, she's honest about that in the sense that she says because her mom was such a controlling manager and eventually she fired her mom and it was a whole thing and like her mom su sued her, it was a whole thing, um, that she doesn't think she ever really learned to be a great actress and it's something that really bothers her, which I thought was it really interesting and candid that like she wishes she'd had a better career but she never had to learn how to act as a kid. She was just good at memorizing lines and being natural. Um, I love that, I like that kind of emotional honesty in a memoir. Um, and she does spill some tea, so to speak. She has some choice things to say about a couple of exes, Liam Neeson, Andre Agassi. It was definitely interesting and it covers, unlike the Haley Mills one I read, it covers what I would expect it to cover. Starts at birth, essentially, in her child stardom and goes all the way to now. The book was published in 2014. But the lens really is her relationship with her mother because uh, her mother passed away and it was all sparked, and she says in the beginning, by an obit in the New York Times. She submitted an obituary for her mother and they, they edited the obituary to change it to open with basically calling her mother this like nightmare manager who prostituted her daughter. Said slightly nicer. Her. But it, it led to her going, I'm going to write this memoir. Um, and I, I'll say like as a Hollywood memoir, it's pretty decent. But what this book really is, it is about her mother and that relationship. And it is about watching her mother die. Uh, it is about that grief. It is about the accounting of a really intense, uh, dysfunctional parental relationship. And on that level, I think I thought it was really effective, especially as someone who um, li has lost her mother. Um, the passages where Brooke talks about her mother being in, uh, essentially, she, oh, she was in a facility because she had dementia, but it, it, it spiritually felt very similar to my experiences with hospice and just like being there for it and the way she talks about her mother, her, her actual death and the body, like I really... I really emotionally connected to it in the sense that it it, it, it was triggering on a certain level. I, I, I got out a good cry. And to that end, um, if that is something that you don't want to read, this might be a skippable. Um, but for me, it, it was it was the culmination of the whole thing and it was emotionally cathartic because she's really honest about what it was like and what her grief was like. And that was something that I really connected to. Um, and other parts of it as well. So I. I didn't have a dysfunctional 
mother, thank God. Uh, but we did have a very intense relationship. Like Brooke, I had a single mother uh, and I am an only child. And so I really related throughout the, the memoir to those intense feelings, especially when Brooke was younger, of feeling her identity was attached to her mother's identity. They were a pair. And I, I really related to that and the growing pains that you go through when inevitably, hopefully, thankfully, uh, you become an adult and you learn to interact with each other and respect each other as adults. And much like Brooke, I feel like I lost my mom just as we were hitting that really beautiful place of mutual respect as adults, as her adult child. And so for me, this was a very good cathartic emotional reading experience on top of, hey, some good Hollywood nuggets. So I recommend it for that, but to that end, some people may not be interested in this lens at all. Um, and so you can kind of judge for yourself whether it's gonna be one that you wanna read. There is some good like Hollywood stuff in it, but it really, that's really not the point of it. But certainly if you have a complicated relationship with your mother or any parent, if you have an alcoholic in your life, uh, the, the, you know, she talks about that stuff very honestly. Um, and I, it was also just interesting hearing about like, she had some wild times, man. Like being, imagine being rich, beautiful, and famous in New York in the 70s and 80s. It was just, those parts were just kind of fun to read. So that is my summer reading wrap up. Seven books that I think took four months to read. <laughs> But some really good nonfiction, like this, like, uh, though this is also partly because I am going to end up not reading a ton of books this year, but I definitely think some of my favorites of the year are in this reading wrap up and also some of my least favorite books of the year. So it was a very interesting reading stretch. And as always, just like every other reading wrap up this year, I'm going to say like, I really hope I break out of this weird reading funk. I should be done with my thriller soon, or at least before I go into copy edits, and I would like to devour a bunch of fiction, specifically thrillers, because my TBR is, it's obscene. And, and like, it's like this, if you're a mood reader, you'll get this. Like, it's this thing where I theoretically want to read all these books, but I just can't take the leap, and I keep picking up something else instead. I'm currently reading a biography of Marilyn Monroe. So the nonfiction kick does continue, but that's a sneak peek for my next reading wrap up, but who knows when that is gonna be at this point. So as always, guys, give this video a thumbs up if you like it. I'm gonna make more reading wrap ups eventually. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. Thank you so much for watching and happy reading.